this message entitled, Make Every Effort to Come Before Winter. So, make every effort to come before winter. So, today is December 1st, and winter is about to begin. You see the Christmas tree? Is it nice? Beautiful? If you only knew what we had to go through to put that up like that. Stories behind everything here. Anyways, so, 2 Timothy is a book written by Paul, or or a letter written by Paul to Timothy, right? And it was most likely written in prison in Rome just before Paul's death. Okay? So this was written just before he died. So we probably guess that these were the last words written by Paul before his death. Okay? So very significant, right? And we'll pro- we could probably conjecture also that, you know, he told Timothy to make every effort to come before winter, right? And most likely he died that winter. Paul died that winter. Do you guys know how Paul died? He was beheaded in Rome, right? He had it. The, the, the legend goes, the tradition goes, that when they beheaded him, his head bounced three times in Rome. And they say that the three places where his head bounced, there's a spring, that, a fountain that sprung up from the ground. I haven't been there, so I don't know. That's the tradition. Anyways... So these are Paul's final words. So he's like, and he knows this, because if you look in 1 Timothy chapter, uh, chapter 4, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come, right? He said this. He knows that his death is very near. Because he knows that in Rome he's been imprisoned. They're not going to let him go the second time. This is the second time he's been in prison. And they're going to execute him. And he knows this. So he is putting his life in order before he, his departure. And he tells his beloved son in the faith, right? Remember he called Timothy his son. Even though Paul was never married, he never had any children, he called Timothy his son in the faith. That's how much he loved Timothy. And he's telling Timothy to make every effort to come before winter because he wants to see him before he dies. So our senior pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, preached on this very topic twice. And what he said in both those sermons is that we need to listen to these words as if they're being spoken to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way we'll really understand what these mean. Okay? So Paul is telling Timothy to make every effort to come before winter, but we need to listen to this as if Jesus is saying to us, make every effort to come before winter. So what does that mean? Winter is coming soon. It might snow today. Have you guys made the effort To come to Jesus before winter comes? Yes, no, maybe. I have no idea. That's not good if you don't know what that means. All right? So, first, what is winter? A very simple question. What is winter? Winter is the the coldest season of the year, right? It is, in the ancient times, it is a season where they could not travel during winter, especially over sea, like on ship. It was hard to travel during winter because it was very stormy, so that's dangerous. So winter was a season where you couldn't travel. That's why Paul said initially to Timothy to come before winter. But not only that, winter is a season where no food grows, right? 
Nothing grows in winter. Everything dies. It's the season of death, right? You can't plant anything in winter. It's a season where life goes into hibernation, right? There's no planting. There's no food. So how do you prepare for winter? If you don't store up food, if you live in a place where it's really cold in the winter, if you don't store up food, you're going to starve in the winter. If you don't store up fuel to warm yourself, then you will freeze to death in the winter, right? So there's no food, no life, no growing. It's very cold. Unless you have a home and you have enough fuel to heat that home, it's going to be hard for you, right? Nowadays, everything is all good. But in ancient times, these things really mattered. People actually died of starvation or they froze to death in the winter. So you have to prepare for winter. But what about spiritually? Spiritually, what does winter mean? Spiritually, winter signifies the end, the latter part. So if Paul is talking about the winter of his life, it would most likely mean that he's talking about his life, nearing his death, right? So that's why in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, he says, the time of my departure is coming. So when he's telling Timothy to come before winter, there's double meaning there. There's the surface meaning saying, oh, it's going to get cold and stormy, so you can't travel during winter, so you have to come before winter. But underneath that spiritually, what he's saying is, I'm going to die soon, so you got to come before that. But in the Bible, winter not only means death, what happens after death? Hebrews chapter 9, verses 26 and 27 says, everybody is appointed to die once, and then afterwards what? Judgment, right? Everybody has to die once, and after that is judgment. So winter is the season of judgment, okay? Winter is the season of judgment. So, for example, when, when the disciples asked Jesus when he's going to return in Matthew 24, that entire chapter is about the end times, right? And one of the things that Jesus said was, in Matthew 24, 16, he says, when the end comes, if you're in Judea, you have to flee to the mountains. Okay, you have to run away to the mountains. Okay, you got to go all the way up to the top. Okay? If you look throughout the Bible, mountains are very important. And spiritually, mountains signify the church, the true church of the end times where the word of God is proclaimed. New Jerusalem is going to be on the mountaintop. So spiritually, we have to get up there, right? And it's hard to go up. So Jesus said, you must run to the mountain. You must be on the mountaintop before the end comes. All right? That's where our refuge is. That's our spiritual refuge. In the end times, there's going to be judgment and great tribulation, right? And Jesus is telling us, you have to be on the mountain before that day comes. That's what 24, 16 says. And then if you go down to verse 20 and 21, Matthew 24, verse 20, this is, a, this is what he says. Pray that your flight will not be in the winter. Okay? Pray that your flight will not be in the winter. On your way to the mountain here, if the winter comes beforehand, it's going to be really hard. So we need to get there. We need to arrive here before the winter comes. So remember at the beginning of the sermon, I said, think of this as Jesus talking to us. Make every effort to come before winter. So Jesus is up here on the mountaintop. We need to get to him before the winter comes. Before the winter of our individual lives, obviously. But not just that, because there will be a winter of this entire world, right? This world will not last forever. It will end someday, and judgment will come. And before that day comes, we need to be next to Jesus on the mountaintop, right? So that's what Paul is telling Timothy right now. And he's, that, this is what he's telling us right now. 
Are you there or are you still on the way? And if it is, if you are still on the way, will you get there before winter? You have to calculate this, right? Oh, this is, I have to go this far. It's going to take me this long. And winter is coming in so many days. Okay? You've got to think about this. So how did Paul teach us to prepare for winter? How do we prepare for winter? There are broadly two things that he talks about. The first thing is about human relationships. And then the second thing he talks about is things that are needed to prepare for winter. Okay? So Paul here talked about first, before the winter comes, you got to get these relationships in order. Second, before the winter comes, you got to get these things, you, you need to get these things to get, go through the winter, right? So th- let's talk about the first thing, the relationships. He talks about many people, right? And basically before he dies, Paul is putting his life in order and he's evaluating these relationships. He's saying, these are the people that I want next to me when I die and these people have left me. Okay? So in this first point right here, let's think of Paul as symbolizing Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus is saying, these are the people I want next to me, and these people have left me. So we need to be part of the people that Jesus wants next to him, right? Who are the people that Jesus or Paul wanted next to him? Who is with Paul right now? Who has been with Paul all the way through? That blank stare that you guys are giving me. (laughs) Who is with Paul right now? Luke, thank you. Luke has been with Paul, right? Luke is the only one that's with with me right now. Okay? And he's telling Timothy to come and on the way to bring who? He's telling Timothy, Timothy to bring Mark. Okay? All right, Timmy and Mark. (laughs) He's telling Timothy to bring Mark. So he wants these three guys next to him, Luke and Timothy and Mark. Luke has been with Paul throughout this journey. Luke is the guy who wrote the book of Acts and the gospel of Luke, right? So chapter-wise, if you count the chapter in the New Testament, who wrote the most chapters? Paul obviously wrote the most chapters. Second is Luke and then John, right? So he wrote a lot. But this is what senior pastor said. In any of his writings, Luke never mentions himself, except at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke. He never mentions himself. Luke was a very humble man. Remember, he was a physician, right? A doctor. He was probably next to Paul trying to treat his eye infection or disease or whatever it may have been. But Luke was a very humble man, a very loyal, faithful person. He was with Paul throughout the entire journey. And then he's telling his, his son in the faith, Timothy, to come. And he's telling him to bring Mark. Now, this is very important right here. Paul is telling Timothy to bring Mark. Why is that important? You guys know about Mark? His full name is John Mark. Okay? His full name is John Mark. So sometimes he's referred to as John. Sometimes he's referred to as Mark. He came from a pretty wealthy family. And at the beginning of Paul's missionary journey, Mark went with him, okay? And then what did he do? He deserted Paul. He left Paul because the journey was so hard, because they faced so much persecution that John Mark, it was just too much for him. So he just took off. And Paul was very angry, okay? I think Barnabas, in the Bible, you guys have heard of Barnabas, right? We have all these people in our church, (laughs) except for Luke. So Barnabas was probably related to Mark. (laughs) So Barnabas wanted to have Paul and Mark reconcile after that event. And 
Paul said, no way, I'm never taking that guy ever again. He just left me. So because of Mark, Paul and Barnabas got in an argument. Okay? So they separated. Instead of going together, Barnabas took Mark and they went to uh, one place. Paul chose Silas and they went to another place. So there was this, this fight, this breaking out that happened because of Mark. Paul and Barnabas went separate ways. And now, at the end of Paul's life, what is he saying? Bring Mark to me, because he's useful to me. Okay? Paul wants to reconcile. He wants to put his life in order before he goes to see the Lord. Okay? He wants to forgive Mark. He wants Mark to forgive him. They want to be reconciled, and he wants them there by his side. So this is something that we need to understand. Remember what Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. He says, if you do not forgive each other, Father in heaven will not forgive you. Okay? If you do not forgive each other, our Father in heaven will not forgive you. So Paul knows that it's time for him to go to see the Father in heaven, right? He's getting ready. He's preparing himself. He wants to be forgiven if there's anything that he needs to be forgiven for, right? So that's why he wants to forgive Mark. He wants to reconcile. Okay? And then there's this, these are, this is the group of people that he wants next to him. And then there's the second group of people that he doesn't want next to him. And who are those people? I'm going to talk about just two people, right? Demas and Alexander. Okay, Demas and Alexander. So first, let's talk about Demas. So both of these guys were apparently disciples. Okay, they were part of the church, but now they left. What, what, let's talk about Demas first. What, why did Demas leave? It says because he loved the present world, that he deserted Paul. Okay, Demas loved the present world. This expression is very important. He loved the present world. He loved this world right now. And the Greek word that's used here is agape. We know what agape means, right? He loved it a lot. He loved this world unconditionally. Like, he loved it. So he left Paul because this world was so good. So between Demas and Alexander, who was worse? It's a, for Demas, it just says he left this world, right? What is, but what about Alexander? Paul says Alexander not only opposed the church, but he's doing much harm to the church right now. So Alexander was much worse, right? He was a guy who was actively persecuting the church right now. So he's like part of our church, and then he left. Now he's like talking bad about our church. Spreading lies and rumors about our church. Persecuting our church. That's the kind of Alexand uh, person Alexander was, right? But for us here, I think Demas is more important for us. Because why? Because we could become a Demas. We could more likely become a Demas than an Alexander. So why did Demas leave? Paul, why did Demas Desert Paul because he loved this present world. So Demas cared more about the present, here and now. As opposed to, if you look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the same word for love is used, agape, talking about the saints who loved his appearing. Talking about Jesus, right? Who are the true saints? The true saints are the ones who love the appearing of Jesus Christ. Who are, we're all here hoping for the return of Christ, right? We love that. We hope for it. We are waiting for it, right? That's what we put our hope on. 
his physical appearance, as well as his spiritual appearance within each of us. That's what we're desiring, right? We want Christ to appear in our lives, in ourselves, in our hearts, so that we can become like Christ. So these two are opposed to each other. Demas was part of this group here, and then he left because he loved this present world more. He loved what this world had to offer right now, instantly, more than waiting and hoping for the appearing of Christ. That's why he left, okay? Do we, do you guys love the world like that? This is very dangerous because do do not think, oh, Demas was this evil guy. This could be one of us. Because if you love the world more than Christ, this could happen to us. So Demas is a classic example of someone who was not prepared for winter. How do we prepare for winter? The Bible says, go to the ant and learn from the ant. Go look at the ant. How does an ant prepare for winter? Those little ants are dragging things that are like 10 times bigger than its body, right? They're preparing for the winter. They're storing food. They're building homes. To keep themselves warm. They're preparing for the future winter, right? So we need to prepare our, for our spiritual winter. After we die, we will all face the judgment seat of Christ, right? How do we prepare for that? By serving God, believing in Christ, here, right? Demas didn't do that. Instead of looking to the future and preparing for what's coming, what did he do? He said, no, forget that. I'm going to do what's good for me right now, what's satisfying for me right now. I'm going to gratify my desire right now because that feels better. I don't care what happens in the future. There's no judgment, right? Who cares if I miss church a couple weeks? No big deal. Nobody's taking role. Did you guys know that I take role? (laughs) So we need to prepare for our winner. Demas did not prepare for his winner. Proverbs chapter 30 verse 25 says, the ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. See, the ants are wise enough to prepare for winter, but human beings are not. So that's why Demas left, because The present right now is more important for him than what's coming. But we have to realize every action in the present has consequences in the future, right? What we do right now has consequences in our future. So the people of this world, they don't prepare for the winter. They think they do, right? They like invest in retirement funds and all that. They think they're preparing for winter by doing that, right? But that is not preparing for winter because there's another winter after life here, right? So what they're preparing for is up to death. But they haven't prepared for what's after that. A lot of people think they're preparing because they have a retirement fund ready. Or they, have a, they purchased a burial plot. I have somewhere to be buried. Great. But what about after that? Have you guys prepared for that? We haven't, right? So that's who Demas was, a classic example of somebody who gave up preparing for winter and went out into the world. So Paul says, he's gone, let him be. And then after him is Alexander, right? Alexander, it says, did much harm to Paul and the church. He is actively persecuting the church. But look what Paul says. He simply says, he didn't condemn him or hold any grudges. He just said, the Lord, the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Okay. Paul understood what the Bible says. Do not take vengeance, right? That's not... Something that we can do. Vengeance is God's only. Only God can take vengeance. 
So Paul left it up to God. Let him repay him according to his deeds. If his deeds are good, then he'll be repaid good. If his deeds are bad, then bad. Okay? So this is how Paul prepared for his winner in regard to relationships. So we need to be part of the group that Jesus wants next to him, right? Like Luke, Timothy, and Mark. Mark, even though Mark deserted Paul, he did not desert the faith. He does not desert the church. He did not desert the word, right? So that's why Paul was willing to forgive him and reconcile with him. Okay? And then, big number two regarding how to prepare for winter are the things that Paul needed. There are two things, right? Cloak and books of parchment. This is what Paul told Timothy to bring. Bring my cloak and books that are of parchment. So this cloak, what's a cloak? Nowadays, we, won't, we can't understand what this is. In ancient times, this was this big, heavy coat made of goat's hair or some kind of leather. Um, and in... It's very important in the winter months, especially if you're traveling like Paul. This is something that you slept with. It's like your blanket. If you don't have this in the winter, if you're traveling, you will freeze to death. Okay, so th- for ancient peoples, this was very important. And Jesus now is teaching us that we need to prepare our clothes. So do you have your Cloaks? Did you guys go shopping for big winter coats? That's not what this is talking about. <laughs> so, why do we need this cloak? Senior pastor said this, people shiver in the winter cold due to two reasons. First reason is because it's very cold or because you haven't eaten anything. You know, you start shivering if, you, if your stomach is empty, right? So if it's... First reason is because it's cold and you haven't eaten anything. Second reason people shiver in the winter is because they are afraid because of their sins. In the Bible, people who have their sins and are hiding their sins, they shiver because they're afraid that somebody might expose them and embarrass them and point them out and say, oh, you did this, right? The first people who shivered like this were Adam and Eve. So when Adam and Eve first ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they hid behind the tree, right? Because they were afraid. In a sense, they were shivering. And they made clothes for themselves out of fig leaves. But that didn't last. So what did God do out of his mercy? In Genesis 3.21... God made them garments of skin for them to wear. This is like a cloak. Garments of skin, this word for garment here signifies a clothing that covers you from your neck all the way down to your ankles and to your wrists. Everything is covered. Only your head, hands, and feet are not covered. Okay, So it covers your entire body. That's what a cloak is. And this cloak, this garment of skin that God clothed, that he put on Adam and Eve, signifies the atoning death of Jesus Christ, right? Because this animal had to die and shed blood in order for him to make this garment of skin. And that's how Jesus covers us. Our shame and our sin, all those things, God, Jesus has covered us so that when the winter comes, the winter of judgment comes, that we'll be okay. We have been forgiven. We're covered by Jesus Christ's insurance. Amen. Romans 13, 14 says, put on Jesus Christ. Put on what? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Amen, right? 
What does it say? Let me say it again. Put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Revelation chapter 7 verse 14 also says, the ones, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We all need to be wearing this cloak or robe that has been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the way to do that is by repenting. As the year end comes, we always do this, right? We think about the past year. How has our life been? If we need to be forgiven, we need to seek forgiveness and seek repentance. If we need to forgive and be reconciled like Paul and Mark, we need to do that as well. But we got to do this before the winter comes. Remember what Jesus said. If you want to be forgiven by your Father in heaven, you need to forgive each other. And then the second thing that Paul wanted were the books of parchment. This is the Bible, the Word of God. Remember, one of the reasons why we shiver shiver in the winter is because we're hungry, right? Spiritually, if you're hungry, you're going to be shivering in the winter. And that hunger comes if you do not have the spiritual food, which is the Word of God. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we started reading the Bible together at the beginning of the year. I don't know how many of you have been continuing this. Who's still doing this? Joe? Yeah. Only Joe. <laughs> Even if you can't finish, let's continue this. Right? We're reading the Bible, right, together. That is our spiritual food. That's how we could prepare for our winter. But the big problem is this, that human beings, even though ants know when to prepare for what, they know when the winter is coming, human beings, fallen human beings do not know when their spiritual winter is coming. Fallen human beings don't know the times. So let's read Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 7. This is what Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 7 says. Even the stork in the sky knows her seasons, and the turtle dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the ordinance of the Lord. See? The birds in the air, they know when to go to south, to Florida, for the winter, they know when to come back. They know exact, they don't have a calendar, but they know this. But my people, human beings, don't know the times. We don't know what season we are in spiritually. And we don't know how to prepare for that. Matthew chapter 16, verses 2 and 3. Jesus also said something similar. He said, When it's evening, you say it will be fair weather because the sky is red. And in the morning, there will be a storm today because the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times? This is what Jesus said to the Jewish people. You know how to tell the weather, right? Oh, I think it's going to snow today. But you have no idea spiritually where we are in times. So remember that greedy man in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 and the following. He said, oh, I stored up, our, the harvest was so good, I built new barns, bigger barns to store up so much grain, right? And he said, my, he's talking to himself, he says, soul, take ease and relax. Eat, drink, and be merry because I have all this stored up. What did God say? What if God takes you away tonight? Who's going to take all that? So he thought by storing up all this grain, he was preparing for winter, right? But he was preparing for the wrong winter. 
because he died that night. And all that grain means nothing to him. Another person who prepared for the wrong winter is Esau. Remember Esau, Jacob's twin brother? He came home hunting, after hunting, he was hungry. Jacob was making some lentil stew. He says, can you give me a bowl of that stew? Jacob says, yeah, if you give me your birthright. And he says, I'm famished. I'm about to die of starvation. What good is this birthright for me? You could have it. Give me a bowl of lentil stew. So he sold spiritual blessings for one bowl of stew. And then when it was time for him to receive the blessings, he went to his father and his father says, I have no more blessings for you. You sold it away. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17, it says this. It says he was rejected and he found no place for repentance. He lost his chance to repent. That's what it says. Esau never regained a chance to repent. You know how scary that is? He's at the threshold of judgment and he knows where he's going to go if he doesn't repent. And he wants to repent, but he lost that chance. Sorry, you missed out. That's what happened to Esau. Also for the Jews during Jesus' time, in John chapter 12, verses 37 through 40, Jesus performed many signs, right? And they still didn't believe in him. So what happened? God hardened their hearts so that they would not believe. Gave them no chance to repent. These are people who did not prepare for the spiritual winner. So my beloved saints, our spiritual winter is coming. The winter of the world and winter of human history is also coming. We need to listen to what our Lord is saying through Paul. Make every effort to come before winter. We need to be clothed with Jesus Christ. We need to fill ourselves with God's word. And we need to reconcile with those whom we need to forgive in order to be forgiven. So that when the winter comes, that we are right there with Christ in his warm house, filled with his good food, right? protected by his love. I pray this blessing upon all of you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. As we have learned from Apostle Paul that we need to make every effort to come before winter, may we be able to prepare ourselves. Please give us the wisdom to be able to understand how we need to do this, Lord. People of the world prepare with materials and money and things. But help us to prepare our hearts with your word and with Jesus Christ. And help us to truly forgive one another and be reconciled to each other. So that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that our Father in heaven will forgive us as we have forgiven one another. We thank you for your grace and your word that you have given to us, that you have fed us today. And out of the gratitude of our hearts, we want to give this offering to you, Lord. May all the hands that give this offering be blessed a thousandfold. May all of the, their hearts' desires be fulfilled through their prayers. And I pray that you will enable this offering to be used for your glory only. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give glory to God with our applause. Grace.